So just in regards to the 2018 application cycle, um, what was the average accepted uh, GPA? Right, so I'm gonna give both the unweighted and weighted GPA. I know in the past I've stuck with the weighted GPA portion, but I just wanna give um, candidates a sense of what it's like and what we do here. Um, and so in the 2018 cycle, uh, just the one that we wrapped up, the 2017-18 cycle, the uh, unweighted uh, GPA for the accepted students were 3.85 on a 4.0 scale. Uh, when we added the weighting factor, that jumped to about 3.96. So that's a quite significant change. I do want to give a little bit of sense of the um, competitive range, though, mm -hmm. uh, because that's an average. The competitive range for the accepted students were between 3.73 to 4.0, and so that was a competitive range. That doesn't mean there's anybody, um, that doesn't mean that that's it. There's definitely candidates who are below that competitive range. In terms of, I do want to um, answer this question uh, because this question comes up quite a bit mm -hmm. as well. Um, the GPA range that you needed to have to proceed to the bar review, uh, the unweighted range, uh, unweighted GPA for those going into bar review was 3.71, and for mm -hmm. the weighted, uh, that came out to be 3.92. Again, I just want to give you a sense of what the competitor range has been uh, for both graduate and undergraduate applicant. Um, and so the competitor range um, to proceed to fire view was anywhere between 3.24 to 4.0 this year for, for the current cycle. Perfect, thanks so much, Anne. You covered my second question, <laughs> so we're good to go and move on to MCAT. Um, so my question for you about MCAT is how is the MCAT review here at UT and is there an MCAT cutoff? Do we assess it competitively? So um, the MCAT for University of Toronto, we completely use it as a threshold value only. And so as you know, our minimum score is 125 in each of the four sections and nine for the old MCAT system. Mm -hmm. And once candidates meet the threshold, we don't look at the MCAT any further. And so whether you have 125 or 128, it really doesn't matter. It's just a checkbox that uh, we, we look for and then that's really it. It's not factored into our admissions at any more after that point. Perfect, thanks so much, Hannah. I'm just gonna go back up to just make sure that, um, yeah, so I think we covered uh, Julieta's comment. And actually, I'm just going to pop back to the GPA section for a minute because I realize there are some questions now about, uh, about GPA. Um, so one student is asking, do these weighted GPA ranges include grad students and those who have written the academic explanations essay? So those definitely include the graduate applicants in that uh, mm -hmm. conversation. Um, we'll get to the academic explanations essay, essay but we mm -hmm. have not included these students in the general pool because many of the candidates who are coming to us and providing these ex extenuating circumstances, they have all kinds of personal reasons why their mm -hmm. performances during undergraduate studies may not reflect their overall academic outcomes, and mm -hmm. so we factor them um, in a separate pool. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I think that probably answers the second question that you had there too, Jewel. Okay, um, we'll get to the prerequisites question um, in the general application section. So we'll, again, we'll be fielding all of these other questions at, at the end. So um, speaking about the academic explanations essay, that actually sets us up really well for the next section um, because we are going to be talking a little bit about the special consideration and academic explanations essay. Um, so I'm just wondering, Hannah, how do you review the academic explanations essay, and is it something that goes forward in file review? Do your file reviewers get to see that as well? That's an excellent question, um, and this I understand for those of you who are putting together an academic explanations essay full of very personal details, I can assure you that um, our academic explanations essay are reviewed by our special review panel, and when forwarding these essays before we get, even get into the file review screening stage, um, these are anonymized, sent in complete confidence where all of your ide identities are removed so that all they're looking at is your circumstance and, and, your, and your story. And so once we have our um, academic explanations sent to us by OMSAS, we'll uh, first screen up to make sure that we are looking for eligibility and we're only sending the explanations um, for the applicants who are eligible. So those are the candidates who've met our deadlines and have submitted all the materials. And our special review panel will look at these um, uh, essays and they'll provide special consideration recommendations, um, mm -hmm. which is considered a case by case basis. And so by the time that we are ready to send materials off to our file review mm -hmm. stage, this is where we look at your um, non-academic essays. They'll have the considerations adjusted um, 
on all of the essays and your FAR viewers who are looking at your non-academic essays, they have no information of this whatsoever. And everything that we send over at that point already includes, incorporates the adjustments that we have been provided by our review panel. Okay, perfect. Um, so what types of things do you usually see included in the essay? I just saw a question here about a co-op student who was interested in what, like, or was wondering if she should be writing the academic explanations essay. Um, like, who is it for? Is it just for people who have special circumstances, or like, what types of what types of circumstances would you recommend writing on? Right. I think in general, if you have followed a non-traditional pathway, including co-op or a year abroad, and you feel the importance to include that essay, by, like, feel free to include that. Um, there is very standard uh, academic circumstances like co-op where we can uh, provide you with the standardized adjustments just because co-op is something that are becoming a, uh, more and more uh, frequently seen in our uh, among our applicants. Uh, when I talk about the review panel, that uh, pertains to some students and applicants who had had more personal cases where mm -hmm. um, I can't um, be, uh, I can't give you a generalized information because um, it's it tends to be very personal, but any time where you felt you had an extenuating circumstance um, that you've gone through that was unexpected and beyond your control, that's something that you want to just briefly talk about. Uh, with our explanations essay, we ask our candidates to not include medical documents until the review panel requests for that information if required at a further stage because you're putting this material through a very public application platform and we just want to begin with a brief explanation as to anything that is below the regular trend that we see in your in your on your transcript that you just want to bring forward to the committee and that explanation can be you know you had a surgery at the very beginning of your second year and you were not able to manage a full course load or your academic performance dropped a little bit or you had a very significant work experience mm -hmm. due to family's financial reasons or you could have um, been an engineering student in your first year at the university where you really struggled and it wasn't a good fit for you academically and you transitioned to another um, arts and science program and um, the the reasons can be uh, varied and it really depends on your personal circumstances and so uh, if you personally felt in any way that you were impeded um, from those various circumstances include the explanations essay uh, the we're looking for anything just under 250 words and then we'll take a look and we'll apply our accommodations as depend depending on the situation okay perfect thanks Hannah um, and just kind of building on what you were saying a little bit, is there ever any circumstance that the admissions committee looks down upon um, for an applicant writing an academic explanations essay? Absolutely not. Um, these are pers some personal challenges that candidates have gone through. And so, uh, in fact, we just say to our candidates that if there are any circumstances you feel compelled to share with the review panel, please mm -hmm. do so. And this information is reviewed in confidence. So whoever looks at this information as um, have no information on your identity. And that includes the admissions committee. This is a very private and confidential information. Mm -hmm. And so this, um, your identity will not be disclosed in any way. And, and also we don't look down on candidates who provide academic explanations essay because it demonstrates your strength and your resilience. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we respect candidates who choose to share that information or, or candidates who choose not to. That's completely up to you. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, so now I'll just open the floor a little bit. I did see some questions. I'm just going to make sure that. Um, okay, so there's a question here about the academic explanations essay and how do you access, um, how to recalculate GPA based on these academic explanations? Or do we recalculate GPA? Like how does it affect someone's application? Right. So academic explanations essay, um, most of the candidates who submit these is to um, get the weighting considerations or to uh, remove one of the years because it doesn't truly reflect our capacity. I can't generalize and make a statement that it's based on the weighting or based on the year we take away. It really depends on the circumstances that we bring. We also don't disclose the very specific accommodations that um, we have provided for you but one thing I can be certain is that if you did experience something extenuating we'll definitely give you special consideration. Uh, mm -hmm. While we can't give you the details around how much and what kind of accommodation, we're more than welcome to answer your questions on the likelihood. Um, that's something that I encourage you to email our admissions team, Absolutely. and then I can give you a call to talk a little bit more about your circumstance mm -hmm. and work you through what, what you would expect on, on your end. Perfect. Thanks, Hannah. Um, let's just see. Okay, 
Okay, so there's another GPA question. So maybe we'll just, we'll go back to that um, at the end um, because we did cover GPA, but I'm more than happy to, to reopen these questions when we're back in the general application section. For now though, we're gonna move on because I don't see any more questions about the academic explanations essay. Um, so we're gonna move on to non-academics. So Hannah, I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about, you touched on this I think in the beginning a little bit, but how, how were non-academics assessed and how were they assessed in the last cycle? Um, does this change from year to year? Will this stay consistent in the upcoming cycle as well? Right. So, so far for the 2018-19 cycle, um, we will not be introducing any changes in the way that we evaluate the files. Mm -hmm. um, the only change that we will see are the new brief personal essay questions for this mm -hmm. new cycle. Um, and many of you um, have asked us this question on our emails as mm -hmm. well. We at U of T use um, what's called a multiple independent um, sampling methodology where uh, we have various academic, uh, non-academic materials that we receive from you. So that includes, just to recap, three reference letters, um, four brief personal essay <laughs> responses, and three autobiographical sketch statements. Um, these are sent out to our multiple, multiple independent raters, um, mm -hmm. and they rate these files independently from one another. Um, and each rater um, will look at multiple files to make sure that they can provide a standardized rate, rating based on the metric that we evaluated for, uh, we use for U of T. And you can actually um, peek at our, uh, the way that we assess our materials by looking at our non-academic explanation, non-academic components page where we highlighted the four attribute clusters that our raters are looking for actively when evaluating your brief personal essays, your autobiographical sketches. So one of the things that I I want to encourage you to do is as you're putting together your responses, you really want to take a look at these attribute clusters. There's four and think about how do I uh, put together an answer that corresponds to each of these attribute clusters. And so, for example, when it comes to letters or reference, our raters are really actively looking to see how the three letters in total have um, responded to our attribute clusters in, in, in total. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes your residents, Don, may not be able to speak on all four areas, but they may be able to speak on your leadership attribute, they may be able to speak on your scholarly, if they know a little bit about your scholarly work. Your professor in classrooms may not be able to speak on the other three attribute clusters, but they may be able to speak about your scholar attribute cluster. For a brief personal essay, each question corresponds to an attribute cluster. So as you're putting together a response, you want to think about, you know, how did this question tailor to one of the four attribute clusters and put your answers together. Um, very similarly for your autobiographical sketch um, three statements, as you're putting the three statements together, um, you are first of all thinking about what are the three most significant activities that you want to feature and showcase about yourself. Uh, that will allow you to stand out among uh, 3,000 other candidates but how do they in total also correspond to the four attribute clusters? I know these are a lot to think about, but I want to throw you throw in one more uh, layer <laughs> to, to uh, just share with you. Um, because we do have attribute clusters posted, many candidates very often also provide a very artificial answer where I could almost see the halfway between how a candidate looked at an attribute cluster and completely um, adjusted their responses to really mirror the characteristics that we have uh, included as part of our attribute clusters. We ask our candidates to really look at the attribute clusters and reflect on how they uh, how they align with your experiences, but it doesn't mean that your ha answers have, has to be artificial and adjusted mm -hmm. to each last word of our attribute cluster. So one thing that we really encourage everyone to think about is, while it's important to think about our attribute clusters, really also do let your voice speak out because at the end of the day, these essays are supposed to give you that unique voice and your personal experiences as an applicant. And having a unique voice that stand out against 3,200 other candidates is very critical because although we're getting multiple independent raters to look at your file, they're also um, comparing your application against the other applicants that they're assessing. And so you really wanna think about how, how can you make your essay unique? And best way to do that um, is, is always to um, have a second pair of editing eyes, whether it's a writing center coach or whether it's your family and friends. We really get, um, we really ask our candidates to ensure that they can read over that essay for you and, and get that uh, feedback. Perfect, thanks so much, Hannah. You touched on this a little bit and there's, it's a question I had and there's also a question similar to it um, in our comment section. So I was wondering if you'd be able to talk a little bit about who reviews the file. You mentioned multiple independent raters. Mm -hmm. um, on top of that, a question was, um, does, it, does it, a committee sit together to meet the two 
does a committee meet together to discuss the entire file? Would you be able to touch on a little bit about how that review process works? Sure. Um, and so our raters uh, comprised of uh, a variety of members in the U of T community. Mm -hmm. That includes physicians out in the community, uh, faculty members, residents, fellows, students, sometimes broader members of the public, um, education experts, other allied healthcare professionals. And so we recruit our raters from all areas in our society because we wanna make sure that the raters who give feedback or raters who do these evaluations have unique insights that they bring in from the locations that they, they, they serve. And so uh, one of the uh, important key features of U of T's admissions process when working with these multiple raters is that we don't want in any way um, when, when going through these evaluations for our raters to be affected by others. And so they complete their evaluations independently from one another. Um, and they do not get together at the end uh, to discuss the evaluations that comes in the panel because mm -hmm. our research shows that uh, whenever the traditional panel um, style uh, evaluations unfold, uh, very often um, they tend to mirror the most senior person who is completing the evaluations. And so all of our evaluations, evaluations are done by our multiple readers in an independent setting. Mm -hmm. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to ask a little bit about the ISAP and VSAP file review. So um, is there any different difference with the file reviewing for, for those candidates? Right, and so one of the commitments that we've made to our mm -hmm. community as we we're launching our ISAP and VSAP program were that at least 50% of our raters, so that includes both file reviewing and the interviewing raters, uh, were from the community. So every cycle, uh, we send out a, a large call out for our volunteers from both our indigenous and black community to ensure that um, in within our file reviewer and within our interviewer pool, mm -hmm. there are um, file reviewers and interviewers from each of the communities that reflect our commitment. Perfect, thanks so much, Hannah. Um, I'll just wait a moment to see if there's any more questions that come in about non-academics. Don't see anything. So if you have any more questions, like I said, we're actually moving on to the general application section of our discussion now. Um, so we'll be getting to all of those other questions that we didn't answer earlier in this live stream. Okay. Well, that's a reference question. So maybe we'll get to that um, just after we ask a few more questions about the general application process. Um, so this is specific to the 2018 application cycle. Um, how many applicants did we have in the last cycle? So we had 3265 applicants. Okay, perfect. And um, how many of those make it to a full file review typically? Right, so typically we review anywhere between 1900 to 2200 files. It mm -hmm. really depends on how competitive our, our pool is for that cycle. Mm -hmm. This recent um, cycle that we're just finishing up, we sent 2048 files uh, out to our in-depth file review. Oh wow, okay, perfect. Um, and then how many how many of those people who get that detailed file review are invited to interview at U of T? Right, so this year we made an interview um, invitation out to 639 candidates. Perfect, thanks so much, Hannah. Um, so now I think that concludes the questions that I had for you, but like I said, there were some questions in our comment section. So I'm just gonna scroll through these now. Um, so these will be general questions. And of course, if you have any more questions, please feel free to write them in the comment box and we will get to them. Um, okay, so there's a question here about um, the graduate supervisor reference letter. Mm -hmm. So is it okay to have your graduate supervisor reference letter submitted only for the grad school reference and have other personal references for the main three? Or does it raise flags if you don't have a personal letter from your grad school supervisor? That's completely fine. This mm -hmm. depends on um, right who the best referees are for your regular three. The graduate supervisor letter is so specific to your graduate uh, productivity that if you see that person not being able to be uh, speaking on other aspects, you're free to choose others. Perfect, thanks so much, Hannah. Um, can we count credit, no credit courses towards, uh, this is specifically about humanities, social sciences, but any of our prerequisite courses? Absolutely, no grades are required as long as you pass. A good question. Um, how is productivity defined for graduate students? Right, and so actually, um, you can almost guess what we're looking at just by <laughs> looking at our CV templates. We're looking at uh, academic productivity beyond your grades in graduate school, and so on our CV, we've highlighted some uh, sections including publications, conference presentations for some of the engineering students that may be uh, licenses and patents. Um, some of the students who are in humanities that may include other types of non-traditional 
uh, publications on, on journals and whatnot. Uh, and it also includes section for teaching activities. These are not um, pertaining to non-academic employment, uh, but more so related to your academic employment in settings such as TA or working as a uh, research assistant. And so um, if you look at how, eva how evaluations are done, it's completely done in a holistic fashion just mm -hmm. because we have to look at the whole picture of your productivity, looking at um, how you've actually use up your time as a graduate student by looking at these various factors. Perfect. Thanks, Hannah. Um, so Jim asks, does a higher GPA near our competitive average give an applicant an edge? And is that why the average accepted GPA is much higher than, um, I think what you mentioned in the general competitive range of a three, the minimum of that being a 3.73? I think um, GPA is a factor for sure, and so having a high GPA definitely doesn't hurt. Mm -hmm. um, you may have joined us um, as we're speaking about this too. Mm -hmm. The reason that I have the school as a competitive range and not the lowest GPA is because we do have candidates coming in with uh, amazing extracurriculars or with extenuating mm -hmm. circumstances where they may fall uh, below our competitive range, uh, but in, for the most part, GPA is an important factor. Perfect, thank you. Um, so for the three autobiographical sketch statements that you, that applicants can pose, is it recommended that um, applicants pick one from each category? So like one research experience, one volunteer experience, and one work experience? Um, or do you recommend a different way of approaching that statement section? Right, so as you recall, we are evaluating your material across our four attribute clusters. And so you have to be strategic about how each and one of these three activities um, tailor, right? Or, or can answer to the four attribute clusters and sometimes for this, that that means for some people picking and choosing different types of activities sometimes it may not um, within two different types of research experiences uh, one may have been all about your scholarly achievements whereas in another you may have taken on a little bit more of a leadership role it's really uh, focusing on what you have gained out of those experiences um, in terms of variety that's something that you have to make a con conscious decision about um, so for example I had a conversation with an applicant last year uh, last year who wanted to focus on an activity that they've only done for one hour um, and sort of disregard the other activity where they have spent 10 years working on just because they were worried about activities being too close in nature. But one of the things that I ask candidates to think about is what kind of um, experiences and learning you have gained from these activities when you're making that selection. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, Rodrigo, I see your, uh, your question about tips for improving the general application and I'm thinking that I might hold off on that one because that might be a really great question to close our Facebook Live session on. So um, once again, noted um, and we will get to it. So there's another question here about um, the autobiographical sketch essays. So do you write about the experience, how the experience speaks to a cluster or how that experience will make you a better physician? or had that experience made you into who you are, like where there's no prompt for an autobiographical sketch essay, um, what types of things should applicants touch on in the essay? Mm -hmm. I think um, we generally leave that up to the applicants. Um, it's something that you are explaining, thinking about our attribute clusters, but there is not really a prompt where we're giving you so, such as our brief personal essay. Mm -hmm. This is where you talk about your experiences and if you're able to bring in some personal narrative and examples of how um, they align with their attribute clusters along with your learning, that's a bonus. But we've also seen um, essays where applicants did not follow that um, format mm -hmm. and they did a fantastic job. And so uh, generally we leave it very general, um, talk about your experience and while you're thinking about our attribute cluster, but in terms of how it shapes up in the end, that's up to you. And we, we, we like seeing sort of different ways um, as long as they make logical sense as they're reading through your experiences. Yeah, definitely. I'm like looking at content over style. Mm -hmm. So you might be able to write a really awesome poem about your um, experience volunteering, but might not be the best place to put it. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> I have, 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 we have seen poems. <laughs> exactly. So just wanted to add on to your point about, about what to include. Um, so there's another question here about reference letters, which is a great question, one we receive a lot. Um, so does the position of the referee matter? So a faculty, uh, a faculty member, a director, someone who's on tenure, um, or one that's, or sorry, with a less personalized, so if someone with, I guess, a high status position writes a letter um, that's maybe a little bit less personalized, does that have an advantage over someone who's not in as high a position, but can tailor the letter a little bit more personally and perhaps um, speak more holistically about right. a candidate? 
That's an excellent question, mm -hmm. and I want to iterate that the position of your referee does not matter at all. Uh, one thing that we ask all our uh, candidates to carefully think about is whether the referee has any personal relationship with you that may be interpreted as non-objective. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, it doesn't matter if it's an RA uh, who you have lived in residence for two years, who can talk about your uh, commi committee experience in the food committee. It doesn't matter if it's coming from a TA um, or faculty. Mm -hmm. uh, we ask you to carefully choose the three referees who can really speak about your potential as position to the best of ability. And sometimes it may not be your bio 100 instructor who have had mm -hmm. um, hundreds of other students asking for the same type of referee. As much as, um, as much as your referees can personalize your better, I think the better chance you have when it comes to the evaluations because they can speak so closely uh, with examples right on the attribute clusters that we have highlighted for you. Absolutely. Um, so another point on, on references, um, does it matter if they're from different periods of your life? So is it okay to have a reference from, can you have a reference from all grad school activities or should you have them kind of more scattered throughout your different experience? Mm -hmm. And that's, um, that's a good question. Uh, one of the things that we ask your candidates when they're selecting referees is to think about who can be your best referee. Um, you don't wanna probably uh, choose someone from 15 years ago where, we, where they may no longer be able to speak about your leadership or scholarly. Mm -hmm. We don't have a, a time frame cap on these um, referee selection, but at the same time, you wanna be able to choose someone who can speak about your recent uh, five, to three to five years, right, mm -hmm. of, of your, um, performance as an adult learner or as a, as a leader and that's something that um, students may not always have um, and so make sure that you check with us and we're happy to clarify those questions for you. Absolutely and one thing that I recommend to, to applicants when they're choosing references is to bring in the four clusters that we that Hannah mentioned mm -hmm. earlier and show them to the referees and let them know that that's specifically what we're looking for and ask them which of those clusters that your referee would feel comfortable writing on. Um, that can be helpful in two in terms of picking the person who is best to write the reference for U of T MAD. Okay, so there's a question, an, another question about academic explanations letters. So if I spread out my courses over the summer semester, so you didn't take a full course load during the fall winter, should you write an academic explanations essay to explain that situation? Right, generally that is not uh, needed because many students will be in your position, but mm -hmm. if there was a particular reason as to why you chose not to take a full course load and you are asking for special consideration, mm -hmm. and that's something that we're willing to review, um, but if there was no particular reason, then it's also okay. Many students go through their academics and manage it in a different way, and, mm -hmm. and that's quite common, actually, frankly. Okay, thanks, Anna. More questions. So I think it may be a good time to perhaps touch on Rodrigo's question. Um, so essentially, what he was asking is if you applied in a previous cycle, so maybe you applied in this 2018 cycle and you're looking to reapply in this new application cycle, like what types of things can be done to refresh an application or to make it stronger? Right. And um, that may be something that. Um, First of all, I recommend um, booking an appointment with Hannah Stevenson here um, just to talk about the general process mm -hmm. and any specific questions that you may have, uh, especially if you need to submit something um, such as academic explanations essay. Mm -hmm. General tips for everyone that I give uh, at this time is we're very um, careful with our deadlines and so mm -hmm. I have gone over a couple of deadlines at the beginning of our chat and uh, if you are, as you're preparing your application, I really ask you to really mark those deadlines and adhere to them. Uh, and then as you're preparing your application materials, I also ask candidates to really carefully look at our attribute clusters once more mm -hmm. and ensure that you are writing uh, contents that are very um, right close to our attribute clusters while letting your unique voice speak out. One of the things that um, we look for every cycle is to look for a diverse class mm -hmm. that can serve the greater Toronto population. Mm -hmm. And it's there is no specific successful profile per se that we're looking for. And so we're really looking for um, unique students who are able to serve um, different types of healthcare population. We have emerging mm -hmm. uh, needs in the area of geriatrics. We have refugee and inner city health. And we have all kinds of healthcare matters that are uh, arising in the city. And so we're looking for students who have diverse opinions and different backgrounds. and letting that information speak out um, in your autobiographical sketches and your personal essay responses. Those are really critical and I think that um, they will also give you that extra edge um, over. And so uh, part of the right challenges of doing that is um, how do you know your essay responses are high quality and 
that's something that you want to think about as you're writing it together, but also seek help from others who can give you that editing support. Mm -hmm. um, the other um, last piece that I will mention again is that, you know, we have uh, an excellent team of mm -hmm. um, uh, student services and enrollment assistants in our office who can meet with you and answer questions around mm -hmm. our attribute clusters and our general policies. And that's something that uh, we are very happy to do so. And mm -hmm. so uh, if you have some time to visit our office or book an appointment through uh, phone, that's something that I encourage you to do as you're putting together your application. Perfect, yeah, we consider our office space a welcome center. So um, if you want to drop make an appointment, that's perfectly fine, but you're also more than welcome to drop in to our office. So during the summer, our office hours are from 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. And then during the, the rest of the year, we're open from nine to five. And there's pretty much always someone in our office able to speak with you about uh, admissions to medical school. Likely it would be me unless I'm not here. And I'm always happy to sit down with prospective applicants and help kind of iron out the process because it can be a little bit overwhelming. Because um, even though Hannah was wonderful in explaining everything, it's, it's a lot of information. So sometimes there may be personalized questions you need to ask. So um, always feel free to, to pop in or call us or, or send us an email. And after this concludes, um, I will post all of that in the comments section of this. So um, like I said, please feel free to get in touch. We're, we're here to support and help you. Um, I do see a few more questions and I just think, I think we're going to conclude the Facebook Live here, but if you do have any more questions that you want to, um, to keep posting, I will get on after this and respond to your questions manually um, on the Facebook chat function. So please feel free to ask them. And I'd like to thank Hannah so much for, uh, for being here and explaining all of our admissions processes and recapping the 2018 cycle. And uh, like I said, please feel free to get in touch if you have any more personalized questions. Thank you. Okay.